plastic surgery today. Uh, and it's hump day with Dr. Alex Earl. So uh, today we're going to be talking about a uh, very special uh, subject. Uh, and then of course after that I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. So this is hump day. Uh, for those of you who have may not seen it before, uh, this is something that we do every Wednesday or almost every Wednesday. Um, it's where you get to ask me any plastic surgery related question that you may have. And uh, of course as you know I'm a double board certified uh, plastic surgeon so you know that you're going to get uh, the right answers uh, right here. Okay? Alright so today uh, I'm going to talk about burns after liposuction, okay? Um, so, as you know, many of you know, you've probably seen it, you've probably, it's probably happened to you, um, there are potential for burns after liposuction. Now, uh, not all burns are due to the same reason, not all burns are created equal, okay? So we're actually gonna go ahead and break that down uh, so you can understand, you know, what can cause a burn um, and, you know, the different reasons why, why that may uh, or may not happen, okay? All right, so the first thing I wanna, I wanna uh, kinda let everybody know is that there are different types of burns after liposuction. So it's not just like one thing, okay? Um, or at least what, what, we, what we call burns and what kind of people in the community call a burn, okay? Um, there's your thermal injury, your thermal burn. That's actually what most people think of, about as a true burn. You know, it's basically something hot uh, actually burns the skin, okay? Then you have what, we're, what we call lipo burn, okay, and I have, as you can see here, I have a burn in quotation marks because it's not actually due to a thermal injury, it's not due to heat, okay? And then down here we have your faha burn, again, burn in quotation marks because the faha burn is also not due to heat, so it's not a thermal injury, okay? So I thought I'd start here with like kind of your more classical burn. So you have your thermal injuries, um, and this is done when you're doing uh, certain types of liposuction or when you're adding something to the liposuction, okay? Something that imparts heat. So what are those? So you may have heard of vasor liposuction with a V, okay? So vasor liposuction actually uses an ultrasound energy to heat the tissues, okay? Uh, which is done first. That's kind of like the, the first, or let me say that it's the second step. The first step in all liposuction is, is instilling the tumescent fluid, okay? And then the second step in the vasor liposuction is using that, that wand with that ultrasound energy that imparts heat to the tissues, okay? And then the third step is the actual liposuction when you're sucking out the fat, okay? So now this type of ultrasound is not the same type of ultrasound that's used for imaging, okay? So the ultrasound that I use on the BBL to, um, you know, to see where my cannula is is a totally different type of ultrasound uh, used. That ultrasound does not impart heat, obviously. It's, it, what it does is it creates an image for me to see my cannula underneath the skin, okay? This type of ultrasound used for the vaser does impart energy, and therefore it does heat the tissue. So if that is done uh, on a setting that is too high, or it's done too aggressively, or you pass the wand in the same area too many times, it can cause an actual thermal injury, an actual burn, okay? The other type of um, the liposuction that you may have heard is what people call smart lipo, okay? So smart lipo is just kind of the, you know, the, the marketing term, but smart lipo actually uses a laser. So a more correct term would be laser lipo, okay? And that laser, again, that laser does impart heat, okay? So if that is done incorrectly or it's too close to the skin, or for too long a time, et cetera, et cetera, it can cause an actual burn, an actual thermal injury uh, when you do that laser lipo, okay? And typically when you see that, it's essentially a third degree burn, but from the inside out, as opposed to, you know, if you put your hand on something hot, you can get a third degree burn if you leave it there too long from the outside in. This does a burn from the inside out uh, in the skin, okay? All right, there's two other things that could potentially cause a thermal injury. One is the J-plasma, okay, a lot of you have heard of that, used for skin tightening. This is done typically after your liposuction. So step one, it's a mess of fluid. Step two, you do your liposuction, you suck out the fat. Step three, you use your J-plasma. Once again, now this uses a different type of energy. Uh, it's called radio frequency or RF energy, okay? But the point is that it also imparts heat, okay? That's what causes the skin to contract, okay, and the skin to then you know, retract back, and that's why it's used 
to help, especially people that have, say, mild to moderate skin laxity, okay? So what, what allows for that to happen is the heat that's imparted by the machine, which is that RF energy, okay, that creates a controlled inflammatory response uh, that allows for the skin to kind of contract or retract back, okay? However, once again, if it's done too close to the skin, if it's done at too high a setting, if you pass the same area too many times, it could potentially cause an actual thermal injury. Okay, and then I have here with a question mark, the body type. Because you may be thinking, well, Dr. Earl, you use body type. Um, is that the same thing? And so it is very similar to J-plasma. It also uses the RF or radio frequency type energy. But what, what the body type has that the J-plasma does not have is it has an internal, uh, basically an internal thermometer. So it tells you when the tissues are getting too hot. And when it does, it alerts you so you can stop or if it gets you know, to a certain point, it actually turns it off on its own. So that's one of the things I love about the body type, that's why I, I prefer the body type um, as opposed to the J-plasma, is that it has these feedback mechanisms that make it a little bit safer and make it uh, so that you know, the chances of burning someone, at least burning them significantly, uh, are much, much less, okay? All right, so the body type, uh, that's why I had the question mark there, but I think the body type is great to try to prevent these types of injuries. Okay, all right, so these are the, the thermal injuries of what we classically think of a burn. Something heats up, it burns the skin, it burns the tissues, okay? Now we go on to what's probably the most common burn after liposuction, which is why people call it a lipo burn, okay? But as you can see here, I have the burn in quotation marks because it's not a, a thermal injury. It's not due to heat, okay? It's due to one of two things. One is what we call a touch injury. Okay, a touch injury is when the tip of the cannula hits a particular part of the skin, you know, too many times and causes trauma to the area. That trauma then basically depletes the vascular supply and so then that skin basically undergoes necrosis and that skin dies. Okay, so that's a touch injury. Uh, and then the other, uh, you know, thing that can potentially cause a lipo burn is when you just, when you're too aggressive and you remove too much fat and basically you thin out the skin too much. And when you do that again, you're removing blood supply, then certain areas may not have enough blood supply, that skin's not getting the oxygen it needs, the blood supply that it needs, and so that skin ends up basically turning uh, necrotic uh, and eventually dies, okay? So that's the, 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 what we call, typically classically call the lipo burn, okay? Now, is it related to technique? Yes, to a certain degree it is related to technique. So this is what I want, you guys to understand the more aggressive the lipo okay the more aggressive the lipo the higher the chance of a lipo burn okay so I know a lot of people come in and like you know I want you to be as aggressive as possible or I want to go to this doctor because he's super aggressive um, and he's gonna leave me snatched okay well you just have to understand you know what you're getting yourself into Okay, you have to understand the risks. So the more aggressive the lipo is, once again, the higher the chance of a lipo burn. Okay, for example, there's a doctor here uh, in Miami who's well, you know, known to be fairly aggressive to leave the skin very, very thin, but he cites or tells his patients that there's a 50% chance of a lipo burn. Okay, now that to me is way, way too high. Way too high. I, I would not accept that. Um, you should not have a 50% chance of a lipo burn. Okay, all right, now having said that, um, you know, I'm probably, you know, and then, then you have some surgeons that are like down here, they're not aggressive at all, um, yet their chance of lipo burn is extremely low, maybe they never had one, uh, but then, you know, you're not able to like really calm through the body and the patients are not really happy. Uh, so it's not great to be down here either. So you don't want to be here, you don't want to be here, you want to be somewhere in here, okay? And that's where I think, uh, that's where I think where, where I am here, at pure plastic surgery. So you wanna be aggressive to a certain degree. Of course, you wanna stay within the, the rules uh, given to us by the Florida Department of Health, which means that the max amount of fat that we can remove is 4,000 cc's or four liters, okay? But you really wanna be able to contour the body. And when you do that, okay, unfortunately, you're not gonna have zero, you know, zero lipo burns, but the, the rate of lipo burns should be very, very low, okay? Why is it not zero? Uh, well, sometimes some genetic components come in 
sometimes, you know, patients come in with like this very thin kind of papery skin, which has a higher tendency to, to have issues uh, with their blood supply. Or it may be someone that's like a round two or round three, okay, they have some scar tissue, some fibrosis, they have a higher chance uh, potentially of issues with blood supply, okay? Or someone who's had a previous tummy tuck or some other procedure, again, potentially a higher chance of issues with the blood supply, okay? So, for all those reasons, uh, and, for the, and because of the fact that you don't wanna be, you know, like basically not doing anything, um, you're never gonna have a 0% chance of a lipo burn. So, uh, what are my numbers? So, we, I typically do somewhere around 600 BBLs a year, and I'll probably get about, you know, six what I call significant uh, lipo burns in a year, okay? Somewhere around there, four to six. Uh, what I call significant, probably something, anything bigger than like a, like a, like a silver dollar type of thing. Okay? So when, did, when you do come across lipo burn, how do you treat it? Yeah, we'll get into that. So that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that, that, that really helps, okay, is to try to identify it early. And, and so that can, you can do that one or two ways. Either you're seeing all your patients on, on post-op day one, okay, you're removing everything and take a look at everything. Um, or, and or, uh, you have a massage therapist who really has a lot of experience and really knows what they're doing so that if they see anything, they can alert you to it, okay? Uh, such as our squeeze lady, Coraito, who's here with us. Um, she's got years and years of experience, so she knows what these things look like. As soon as she sees anything that worries her, um, she, lets, she lets us know, all right? And then what do you do to treat it? So the, the treatment typically consists of two things that are fairly straightforward. And one that I wish we could do, but it's, it's sometimes tough to, to um, actually set up. So the first one um, is a, uh, there's a cream, okay? It's called Nitro Bid, okay? So Nitro Bid. Nitro Bid is a nitro paste. It's the same cream that some patients that have cardiac issues uh, sometimes use. And what it does is it dilates the vessels, okay? And it allows for more blood supply. So when you see an area that looks like a lipo burn, you want, to, you want to apply the nitro bed cream to that area as soon as you can. Now the important thing about this nitro bed is, say this is your burn right here, is that you only want to apply it to the burn area itself. You do not want to apply it to the normal skin. And you don't want to apply it with your bare hands. You need to put gloves on. Why is that? Because if you apply it to normal skin or to your hands, it could actually, by dilating all your vessels, cause your blood pressure to drop and then you're going to feel faint and want to pass out, okay? So be careful with this. It's a powerful cream, okay? That's nitro bin. The second thing that we prescribe is something called pentoxifidin. I know, that's a mouthful, right? Pentoxy, and I'm probably even misspelling it because there's probably an extra F or something in there. Uh, but it's called pentoxifidin, um, and that's a medication that you take orally. Uh, again, it helps with blood flow. Are these okay. prescription or over the counter? These are both prescription. So these are both prescription. You cannot get these over the counter. Okay. Um, so typically, if I if I see that, I start the patient on the, on the nitro bid and the pentoxifidin right away, and I usually treat it for about seven days. Okay, so seven days on that, and then uh, hopefully, what used to be a larger spot is now a much smaller spot once you treat it. So say you had a big spot like this, you started treating it the whole thing. By the time everything's done, it becomes a smaller and smaller spot, and if you're really lucky, it goes away completely, okay? Um, and then the third thing that could help, but it is kind of tough to organize, especially here in Miami, um, is a, hyper, a hyperbaric uh, chamber, so a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Um, that could help as well. Unfortunately, it's, it's pretty tough to you know, try to get that organized in a short period of time, and uh, there is not a lot of time to try to treat these, okay? So, what, so, let's, so going back, what are the keys? Number one, identify early. If you can identify post-op day one, that is the best. If you get to post-op day five or seven, by that time, you know, what's done is done. There's really not much that you can do to treat it, okay? So identify it early, start the nitrobate and the toxic filing right away, and if you have access to it, then you can also do a hyperbaric oxygen chamber treatments as well, okay? Thank you. All right, so that is your lipo burn. Why does smoking affect the burns? Oh, great question. Because nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. So it makes the, your blood vessels smaller. It constricts the blood vessels. 
That means there's ble less blood flow, less oxygenation, and so you're, you're going through the trauma of surgery, all right, and these vessels are already small, uh, the chances of them not having enough blood supply to that area of skin are higher. So yes, nicotine can increase your chance of lipoburn, you know, lipoburn, skin necrosis, wound issues. Okay, so typically you do not want to have any nicotine in your system before liposuction or BBL. Thank you. And just to go back really quick, what's the downtime with body tight? The downtime? Uh, so it's typically we come, we're combining that with your liposuction procedure. It doesn't change that downtime. So it's simply so say you're doing it with, you're adding it say to the arms or the abdomen or BBL. Your 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 downtime for, is going to be the same as it would be for the BBL. So you know six weeks, no heavy lifting, no strength activity, things like that. Now, if you're doing just a small isolated area, so you come in for face tight just with a chin, and that's mm -hmm. it. You're not doing anything else. I mean, you're you're back to work within you know 48 hours or so. It's very very quick uh, and painless uh, type of procedure. And can you combine that with a BBL instead of needing, let's say, a tummy tuck after it? Would that? So, can you, so let me take that question in mm -hmm. parts. Can you combine with BBL? Yes. Uh, can you do it and, and avoid the tummy tuck? That's for a very specific, you know, particular type of patient. So it's very patient dependent. So if you have, say, just mild skin laxity, then typically it does work well enough where you can avoid any sort of, uh, you know, skin tightening procedure afterwards, such as a mini tummy tuck or tummy tuck, okay? But if you have, like, you know, fairly excessive uh, or severe skin laxity, say you're a massive weight loss patient or, or you've gone through three pregnancies, you have that overhanging skin, it's very, very loose, lots of stretch marks, body tight's not gonna be enough to help that retract. You're still gonna need that tummy tuck uh, theoretically after, after the procedure. So if you're potentially dealing with a, a lipo burn, does THC affect that? THC in and of itself should not. Uh, like I said, make sure there's no nicotine in whatever delivery system that you're using, okay? That's the most important thing. So yeah, you wanna avoid the nicotine THC by itself uh, would not affect it one way or the other. All right, thank you. Okay. All right. And then the third type of burn is a faha burn. Okay, and this actually, this does exist. Okay, this, there's a uh, faha burn does exist. Again, burn on the quotation marks because it's not a thermal injury. It's not to, you know, due to overheating. Okay. But again, it has to do with blood supply. So, what are the causes of faha burn? Actually, the most common cause is if your faha is too tight. If your faha is too tight, especially early on, okay, say within the first two weeks, it can be so tight that it cuts off the blood supply to certain areas of the skin, and then that skin ends up, you know, looking like a burn going through the skin necrosis in a very similar process to, to the lipo burn, okay? Uh, so faha burns can definitely happen if the faha is too tight, especially if it's too tight early on. That's why those you know, you've seen your stage one Fajas, they're a lot more stretchy, a little bit more distensible, okay? You don't want a Faja that's too stiff and too tight within the first two weeks or so, because that can then cause issues, okay? The skin is very, very sensitive during that time, okay? It just went through, you know, whatever it is, an hour and a half, two hours of what we call surgical trauma, okay? Because, you know, liposuction, you know, that's, that's what it is, okay? Um, and so that skin is sensitive, um, and then on top of that, you throw in a very, very tight garment, it's gonna cut off some of that blood supply and some of that skin is gonna suffer, okay? And that's gonna be your typical uh, faha burn. The other type of faha burn is when you simply, you know, again, that skin is very, very sensitive and something was done when the, when the faha was put on. So I put here like rubbing or cinching type injuries, but you know, that faha rubbed against the skin or you know, when they try to put the little hooks in there, it pinched the skin or the zipper you know, went up, up, up and down across the skin, things like that. You'll see those types of injuries. Some, sometimes those are gonna be described as faha burns, uh, but it's really basically a mechanical injury to the skin uh, from the you know, basically improper or not careful enough um, placement of the faha. Okay. Thank you. Do you use drains after liposuction? Yeah, so I like to use a drain. Um, so I'll use a drain in the lower belly area. It's just the one drain. Typically, we get it out by day, uh, post up day five on your follow up visit. Okay. Uh, but I like to use a drain. It helps control a lot of that fluid that comes out in the first few days. It also aids with the massage. So the massage therapist is able to do her massage and kind of drain the fluid through the drain. Uh, so, so those are some of the reasons why, why I like to use it. Do you perform lipo on women over 50? Um, so 50 actually is the cutoff for me right now. Um, so if you're, 
No, so so no, not right now. So not over fifty. At least for a, lar- a big lipo case, like a three six three BBL. Okay, and is that a more of a risk with the f- being over fifty, or is there? A- yeah. So the well, so a big lipo three hundred and sixty or a BBL. It's a big case. There's a lot of you know fluid shifts and things like that, and so it's sometimes not very well tolerated by uh, you know people that are over fifty. Um, you know there are of course you know different surgeons have different preferences. Um, I think you know up to recently I was doing up to fifty five, and I think you know that was okay. Uh, but really. Uh, you need someone that's going to be very, very, if you're starting, you know, 50 or over, that person has to be extremely healthy. They're going to have absolutely no comorbidities, meaning no diabetes, high blood pressure, thyroid issues, or anything else. So you really want a very, very healthy, very strong individual. Uh, if you're over 50, you tolerate a big case, like a lipo 360 BBL, especially when you're doing it kind of, you know, at the, at the mid, you know, kind of mid aggressive uh, type of level. Um, so that's why it's my preference. You know, even I get, you know, we even have young people. You know, in their twenties, who don't you know, who you know, pass out or have issues, you know, with fluid shift afterwards, they're not hydrating enough, um, and so that's why you want to be careful once you start getting to fifty or higher in terms of age. It's a question about for those coming in for surgery. Can we pick up our meds, our post-op meds, from your local pharmacy prior to arriving in Miami? Um, so it's tough because you know, typically you're gonna need your PCP or someone you know from from where you're from to prescribe that for you. Uh, we certainly can't prescribe n- narcotics across across the state, um, so it's tough to do that at home. But here at Pure, you know, we always see you for pre-op, unless you know it's a special circumstance. But over the overwhelming majority of our patients, we see them the day the day before surgery. So you come in the day before pre-op, and you're going to get your prescriptions then. So you have plenty of time to get all your prescriptions. Not only that, but we're going to we give you a card to a very specific pharmacy that we like to use that always has your medications especially your, your, your narcotics, your Percocet, okay? Because I know we know it is tough here in Florida to sometimes get you know, your, your pain medication from like a CVS or Walgreens. They'll have patients you know, running around the city, going to five different places. It can be extremely frustrating and painful. Uh, so that's why we have, you know, we have a pharmacy that we send you to. Uh, where you get all your prescriptions, you get everything set up, and you'll be ready for surgery day. Thank you. So if you do get lipo burn, how quick does it show up? So, so most of the parts you can, most of the time you'll see it uh, within 24 hours. So typically the most common time that you'll see it is when you're starting your first massage on post-op day one. Okay. Um, and that's the, that's the great time to catch it. If you catch it then, then what you do is you immediately start the patient, like I said, on the nitrobrid, the detoxifying. Um, and you stop the compression. That's the other key, which I, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention before. But one of the key aspects of treatment is to get out of your faha. Okay, no faha. So no faha uh, until we're able to treat this, okay? So no. So stop the compression, start the nitrobate, start the pentoxifylin, and if you have access to it, you can start some uh, hyperbaric oxygen. So when you, if your patient wants a BBL and lipo or one or the other, what's the lowest BMI that you will take? So well, it, make, it does make a difference. So it's BBL, it's typically somewhere around BMI of 22 because we need enough fat to be able to transfer. But if you're doing just lipo, then, then you know, we're, it's not about how much fat we remove, it's about contouring the body, right? Uh, a lot of the younger, the, our lower BMI patients like to do, you know, what's called HD or high depth. A lipo, and that's really not about how much fat's removed. It's about it's about contouring that body, etching out the musculature, and things like that. So that can be even lower than my say nineteen, uh, you know, or so. So another question that kind of on the same topic: What if you can't gain your surgery? Go away. I have surgery with you in December, Doctor Earl. So try your best. You have you have a few months, okay? And what I say is, you know, if you can't do it through your kind of your regular, you know, kind of diet, then do supplement that. So you can use. A supplement such as Boost or Ensure, which will really, it's a kind of an easy way to deliver extra calories, okay? And that can then help you get to your, to your goal weight. Is it safe to do a BBL lipo on a patient with scoliosis? Yeah, so it is safe to do, uh, certainly safe to do, there's no issues there. So what, what becomes an issue though, is a lot of patients that have scoliosis don't know that they have it, right? Uh, and so, uh, then they start looking at themselves and, like, and criticizing themselves in the mirror and start looking at seeing all these asymmetries. Like why is you know, this waist uh, coming in a little bit higher than this side? Or why is this hip a little bit higher than the other? 
okay? And that's typically due to scoliosis, uh, which is of course an issue that has to do with your, your bony foundation. So there's nothing that I or the surgeon can do to change that. Uh, so it's certainly safe to do, but it, it will lead you know, to some continued asymmetries uh, after surgery, and that's okay. That's okay, all right? None of us are perfectly symmetrical side to side. None of us have 100% identical hips, okay? It's fine, so uh, we just have to accept that. And if you have scoliosis, you definitely have to accept that. So, and when you talked about faja burns, how do you know you're wearing the right faja? Right, so like I said, you, you definitely want to start with your stage one faja. That's, that's just kind of for starters. So you don't want to go into like these like super tight, stiff, you know, tributo type of fajas. Uh, initially, okay, so you want to have your kind of you know loo a little bit looser, more distensible stage one faja. That's what it, that's what you want to use um, in the first you know first ten to fourteen days or so, um, and you want it to be snug but not overly tight. It shouldn't be to the point where you know that, that you're having trouble like taking a deep breath. It shouldn't be that tight, especially initially. Okay. What, what lipo parts does it, are included in tummy tuck? And if a patient has fat in the middle of their back, can you make that even? In the middle of the back? Uh, so typically we don't, we, so for most patients, we won't be doing lipo to the back during a tummy tuck. So the, mo the common areas that we do with the tummy tuck are to the flanks and the waist, okay? So we don't do a lot of actually central abdominal lipo, and we don't do a lot of lipo to the back either. Now, uh, why is that? Because in the state of Florida, we're limited to how much lipo we can do at the time of a tummy tuck, which is 1,000 cc's or one liter, okay? Um, so typically, that's what you have in the flanks and the waist, and that's the areas that we want to contour to create that nicer shape. So it's not unusual sometimes to have to separate your light bulb procedure or your BBL from your tummy tuck. Um, so I, I do rather stage it. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the, with the rules down here in Florida, but I think also you get a much better overall result uh, if you're able to separate your tummy tuck from your BBL. So that is my preference. Uh, as well, and recovery is a lot tougher too. So if you're doing a tummy tuck and BBL at the same time, of course you have to be, you know, laying on your back, on your butt, um, and yeah, you can use your zero gravity chairs and this and that, but I think your results are going to suffer overall. Um, so I think it's just a very, very tough recovery, and you're compromising one thing for the other. So in my opinion, the best option is to separate those procedures, uh, your tummy tuck and BBL, and if you have the choice. And, and you know, all things being equal, it's best to do the tummy tuck first, okay? It's a lot better to do the tummy tuck first and then your BBL, okay? Why is that? Because then you can get rid of all that excess skin, okay? Um, you can actually get rid of more skin than you would if you did it the other way around because the skin is still pretty stretchy. So you can really stretch things down, really tighten things up, get rid of all that excess skin, and then when you come back to your four months later for your BBL, Really, really focus on contouring the body and creating those beautiful shapes, that Earl curve, that upside down heart from the back, okay? Um, what happens sometimes when you do it the other way around and you do your BBL first and then is that sometimes it's a little bit tough to contour the body. There's, there's so much excess skin that it's tough to see, okay? Uh, and the other thing is uh, when you go to do that tummy tuck because you know now there's some scar tissue there, there's some fibrosis there, it, it gets a lot tougher to stretch that skin down, okay, and it, it really makes it a much, much tougher surgery. So, all, like I said, all things being equal, um, it's best to separate out the procedures, and it's typically best to do your tummy tuck first, and then your BBL. So the next question is going to be, well, what, what is all, you know, why waste all that fat? Okay, am I going to have enough fat for my BBL if I do my tummy tuck first? So the answer is yes, yes you will have enough fat if you do your tummy tuck first, okay? If you're really, really worried about having enough fat, we can, you know, we can say, well, let's not do the light with the plants and the waist. Let's just get rid of the excess skin. But the amount of fat that's in that excess skin that gets tossed out, it's really, you know, it's really doesn't amount to, you know, that much. Um, and you're still gonna have more than enough fat um, for your BBL. Remember, you still have that whole central abdominal area that we didn't touch. We have still have your entire back uh, that wasn't touched. If you needed to, you can always add arms or thighs. Um, and like I said, if you really, really were worried, you could obviate or not do the light with the flanks and the waist at the time uh, of the tummy tuck if you know for sure that you're coming back. Okay? Thank you very much. How long do you recommend wearing lipo foam after mommy makeover? 
So, yeah, so the foams um, are also important enough for a mind makeover. You typically, you start using it fairly early on underneath your binder because you're going to start off with an abdominal binder and you're going to put your foams underneath there, especially along the sides. I found that a lot of times the binder tends to want to dig into the sides of the patient, and so it's nice to have that lipo foam uh, there to try to prevent that binder from, from digging into your sides there. Once the both drains come out, which is somewhere typically around two weeks or so, uh, then you can switch to a Garmin, okay? And you can still continue to use that lipo foam and the Garmin. You'll use that up until you get to about the six week mark, okay? After six weeks, you can usually not need lipo foam any longer. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Earl. I still have tightness and sensitivity after my lipo body tight of the arms. It's been a little over two months. Is that normal? Yeah, that's not unusual, especially the two month mark. So uh, remember, you're gonna continue to heal, you're gonna continue to settle. We typically don't say, you know, don't, don't tell patients that they're really done with their healing until at least three months out, but there are some patients where it takes longer. It's, I've seen patients where it can take up to a year, actually, to, to you know, really kind of feel like their skin feels like their own again. That's a typical thing that we get, like, like Dr. Earl, my skin, you know, feels like it's funny, like it's a little bit numb, but at the same time, um, you know, it's a little hypersensitive, doesn't really feel like it's my own, uh, and it takes a while for those little nerve endings to grow back. Okay, and it can take, like I said, you know, typically, you know, by three months, most people are, are feeling okay, but not everybody, and that's fine. Don't worry about it. If you're still here, that's fine. Um, but usually, it can, it can take, like I said, it can take even up to a year for things to fully, fully settle out. Do you use the same anesthesiologist all the time? I do, I do. So, um, there's two of them. There's one that's here, you know, pretty much 80% of the time, and then, uh, that's Raquel. I think you guys have met her. Uh, she's done a mm -hmm. few things for us. She, she's talked about the cell saver. Uh, she's our CRNA. She's great. Uh, and she's here all the time. And the only other person we use is actually her husband, uh, who's here every once in a while as well. So always the same to people. We don't have rotating anesthesia, rotating CRNAs. Um, so we know each other very well. I'm super comfortable with them. Um, I've had my own family members have anesthesia with them, and I'm extremely comfortable with that. So if you get a BBL and then get pregnant after, will that affect your results? Yeah. <laughs> uh, pregnancy okay. will always affect your results, okay, no matter what you do. So do you recommend uh, to so, wait? So, I mean, but it, of all the things you're going to do with BBL, is probably the, the one thing that's, you know, it's probably the best thing to do before pregnancy. Like, for example, I somebody say, like, don't do a tummy tuck. Like, if you have any, you know, ch any, like, inkling or thinking about a family, it's really not worth doing a tummy tuck before that because that's definitely going to get all stretched out and everything else. How does the pregnancy affect your BBL results? Well, of course, you, you go through some hormonal fluctuations and some weight fluctuations, okay? So if you're the type of person that really kind of controls their weight, stays active during the pregnancy and everything else, well, uh, you know, then that will give you a better chance to try to maintain those results. Uh, if you uh, either have a difficult pregnancy, a lot of hormonal changes, or really, really like uh, start to eat a lot and gain a lot, a lot of weight um, during your pregnancy, that's definitely going to affect your results uh, and probably, you know, hinder your results even further. So, what's my advice? If, yes, it's okay to do a BBL beforehand, but if you do get pregnant, make sure that you are on top of your nutrition, on top, on top of your exercise, and try to have a healthy pregnancy that way, such that after you you have your 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 kid, you know, um, you're able to bounce back much, much quicker. All right, so when it comes to nutrition, do we really have to feed the fat after a BBL, or, or can we eat healthy to avoid gaining weight? Um, so so I, I would take a little bit of both. I think it's important to feed the fat, but I also think it's, that you shouldn't just, you know, you know, eat a whole bunch of junk food, basically. That's not what I mean by feed the fat. What I mean by feed the fat is to increase some of the healthy fats in your diet, such as avocados, eggs, salmon, macadamia dust, and then yeah, you can supplement with some milk products such as you know uh, ice cream uh, or milkshakes as well. But the key is to to certainly maintain your weight. Perhaps you may gain say I don't know two, three, maybe up to five pounds, uh, but you're not yet. Yeah, the the point is not to gain like you know. 15, 20, 30 pounds. You, you do not want to do that, okay? That's not, the, that's not what we mean when we say feed the fat, okay? You wanna increase some of this, these healthy fats in your diet, and you wanna maintain your weight. Maybe you gain you know, two, three, four, or five pounds, but that's it, okay? Um, and what that's gonna do, it's gonna 
give you know the nutrients that we need to the new fat cells that we've just transferred that are trying to basically get vascularized and survive. So, you, def you definitely don't want to lose weight in your recovery. Okay, don't do that. So for a lipo 360, does that include the upper back? So not the upper back when we're talking about the buffalo hump, which is this right here, okay? But it does include pretty much most of your back. So it's basically from about this level here all the way down, which is above your bra line. So from above the bra line all the way down. Is there a way to get a BBL with factor V laden? No, well, not, not for me anyways. Uh, in terms of my criteria, uh, if you have factor V, um, then you're not a candidate for office-based surgery setting. What do you recommend for tummy tuck scars? So I do like to start off with Silogen, which is silicone-based scar cream, okay? And you can do that starting at two weeks post-op. Um, and you wanna do that pretty diligently. So twice a day, every single day. Don't miss, don't miss a day, okay? And if you do that, typically you're gonna, you'll end up with a nice, kind of thinner, flat, um, you know, not, not discolored, but skin-colored uh, type of scar, okay? Um, if you do feel that even, even with doing all that, it starts to get raised, uh, like it wants to become hypertrophic or keloid, it's best to try to identify it early and then hit it with a steroid, uh, like a catalog shot, uh, to try to prevent it from progressing any further. I'm not sure about this word, but when can I start back aptamine after a BBL? Apetamine? Apetamine, there we go. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, sounds right. Um, or, well, I'm, or phentermine is the other one. But uh, so phentermine is typically for gaining weight. Um, and uh, you know, usually you can start that two weeks after BL, you really need to, but um, you really, like I said, you don't want to be gaining a ton of weight after your BBL, okay? You want to be maintaining the weight mostly. Um, if you're talking about phentermine, again, that's for weight loss. Again, you do not want to be losing weight as you're healing from a BBL. So you definitely don't want to be starting that after your procedure. Uh, at least now for at least three months uh, post-procedure. And before you go, do you have any updates on your on-site consultations and will you still be taking COVID tests? Um, so not a lot of updates right now. So we're doing mostly virtual right now. We haven't really kind of fully opened up to, uh, to live uh, in-house consultations, okay? Uh, but things are rapidly progressing. A lot of people are getting their vaccines. Um, so, you know, it's probably going to be changes uh, towards the end of the year. And in terms of the COVID test, yes, we are still requiring uh, our surgical patients, especially our surgical patients, uh, to do their COVID test. Uh, because the last thing that we want is for someone to go under general anesthesia, have a tube, you know, down their throat uh, while we do surgery who is brewing COVID. Okay, that could be a, potentially a bad combination. Um, and, and then end up with some respiratory issues after surgery so we don't want that so it's really a patient safety issue okay so whether you're vaccinated or not uh, we want to make sure that there's no COVID in your system before you undergo what's well, essentially major surgery under general anesthesia thank you dr okay. Earl. all right everybody okay well i hope this is very helpful i hope it explains things i think people understand the concept now more um and of course uh, we can go over you know, these subjects and any subject that uh, you want us to discuss, uh, and I'll be here to answer all your questions on Hook Day uh, with Dr.